Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance, and HR, to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Three, two, one, and we're live. I am here with uh, Courtney Pegram, PhD of Pegram Consulting and Bulldog Solutions. How are you doing, Courtney? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us on the Ethics Experts today. I'm, ex uh, I'm real excited to get you on and uh, for our listeners to hear about some of the stuff that you're doing, how you kind of got into this game, and you know, hopefully we can walk away with some actionable steps to help kind of elevate ethics and compliance professionals um, to make that impact and be that strategic lever in their organization. So thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah. So let's just, let's just jump in. Maybe tell, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into this game, and what's kind of, what's top of mind for you right now. Oh, uh, well, perfect. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how I got into this is I'm the founder of Bulldog Solution and Pegram Consulting. We're a social enterprise. So we do anti-bullying, anti-violence in schools, and we also have a corporate component where we do sexual and workplace harassment training. So the cool part about our business and where my passion is, is for every program that we do um, in corporate, we then donate a program for anti-bullying, anti-violence. So wow. I get to go back, yeah. <laughs> That's a really cool thing to do because um, it's well needed, right? And mm -hmm. a way to kind of make, make it happen. Right. And it kind of, it brings me a lot of joy and that's really important to be passionate and love your work. Um, because I get to work in a field where like, you know, corporate where things change, evolve cultures, organizations, like all that amazing dynamic. And I also get to give back where I can really make a def difference in the education field as far as education and social emotional learning. So what kind of drove your focus? Um, and the types of programs that you're administering for, for schools? So there's a, a huge need, and I think it's not only like school-wide, it's more like, you know, organizational-wide, community-wide of understanding like that emotions play a huge part in day-to-day -day interactions. And if we don't know how to manage and um, almost read these emotions, it really can have a negative impact on the way we talk to each other, interact. So that would really, and bullying is a huge problem. And I'm just done with the labels of he's a bully, she's a victim. Um, he said, she said, they said. And I found that there's ways of fixing that through um, kindness, connection, and social boldness. Yeah, I think when we were talking before, I think uh, you, you said this, or if you didn't just take credit for it, okay? But like hurt <laughs> people hurt, right? So yeah. if somebody's hurting, you or somebody's hurting somebody else it's because they're probably hurting at their core or at that sort of emotional root <laughs> yeah i did say that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so when i do my programs i always tell um teachers or parents i was like a, a child is not born to bully so anyone that's bullying or being mean is they are hurt so it's like a, almost a cry for attention a cry for help of like please help me i'm hurting so i'll hurt you because I've never met a happy-go-lucky person that was a bully. Yeah, that's true. Um, but what it ends up doing, or what they end up doing, you know, kind of inadvertently is putting this prickly, this prickly outer shell out there that makes them, you know, pardon the, the analogy, but like hard to hug then, right? It's hard to kind of get through that to, that to that pain that's underneath it all. And many times people, I think, end up kind of carrying that with them their whole lives. And they grow up into workplace bullies and um, mm -hmm. the same things don't just fall away when we get out of high school or get out of, you know, wherever. Right. It's like, it just doesn't happen on the playground anymore. It happens in the workplace. It happens. I mean, it happens in PTAs. It happens in community groups. Um, and you're right. It's, it's, they, they become so like people that are hurt and become bullies or have, um, really judgmental personalities are very hurt and they're also hard to like break that shell, right? They have a whole shield protecting them. Like I'm going to hurt you before you hurt me attitude. And um, there's like no room for love. Right. When that's actually the thing that they need most. Right. And like we get really uncomfortable about talking about that for some reason, like it's still really taboo to talk about love and caring even when we're trying to train on emotional intelligence and social emotional learning. Yeah. Why is that? You think? I think it's uncomfortable because we don't see it 
we're still new. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't say like, as you and I have been talking and stuff, I don't think we're new it, but it's still new to talk about emotions in the workplace. And it's still new to talk about emotions in the educational field because we pushed them away for so long of like, you know, just do your work, just do your test. <laughs> but yeah. we're driven through emotions. <laughs> But do you, and how much of that is a cultural thing and how much of it is just kind of a human thing and how much of it is just sort of a, this is the age we're in thing? I think we're in an age of evolution and change that is pretty dynamic. And especially with, you know, technology advancements are made so fast that it's, it's exciting, it's new, but also we're skipping the steps of connection. So I feel like we're not understanding why we're doing what we're doing and what's driving that. And when right. we stop, it's all about emotions. And it's, I was talking with a friend of mine, Leah last, um, last week, and she was kind of saying some, some of these same things. And we were, we were kind of getting down to the fact that today there's so, so little like true human connection, right? We're bombarded mm -hmm. with notifications and emails and all this other stuff. Um, it ends up sort of dampening the possibility for these connections, which is to your point, what we actually need to kind of make this evolution uh, come full circle or to really kind of help take us to the next level in your work, both in the schools and in corporate, like what are the, what are the things that, that you see sort of common in both places? Obviously, you know, the ages of the constituent groups in both these places are very different, but they're still the same thing. I, I mean, the same feelings are there. I think the same sort of problems are there. They just sort of manifest in, in different ways and they're maybe a little bit more subversive on the corporate side than they are. And they're more blatant on the school side. But I mean, what do you think is going on there? Right. So that's a great question. And it's often I've, I've brought it to my staff too. And I was like, okay, so what is going on? There is an increase in distrust, increase in lying in manipulative behaviors and um, also like just, just plain being mean to protect themselves in school and then in corporate, which is, it's, it's really scary. Um, and I find that also what's happening is there's a push for equality and a push for like, you know, um, everyone having a voice and advocacy. So like, it's, it's like, it's, it's starting to balance itself out. But what I've seen the most is people are afraid to trust. So they don't let any room for connection because they're afraid to get hurt. It comes all about getting hurt. Like resentment is at an all time high <laughs> right. in my schools. <laughs> like, I mean, I work with children that are in middle school or high school and they're like, yeah, I am never going to talk to him because he bullied me in third grade. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, people don't forget it, you know? Oh, they don't. I mean, don't. The memories that, that we have when we're, when we're kids, those happen to us and the us just ages a little bit, but you know, those impacts are still there. And that's why I think it's so uh, visceral for folks. Right. And like, I still get a lot of pushback on forgiveness. So we do a lot of work on resentment and um, people really push back on like, well, I, I'll never forgive them or that will never happen. And, you know, um, saying you're sorry is weak, a sign of weakness. And I just, right. it mind blows me because to be like, even come, what we were talking about being ethical and, and working towards like building corporate cultures or better school cultures, you need to be able to forgive, to apologize and to trust. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think you, you touched on something really important. You said, uh, saying I'm sorry is looked at as a sign of weakness. And in my mind, it's always been a real sign of strength when someone can say, you know what, I kind of screwed up here and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I made you feel. I mean, you're owning your impact at that point. You're um, admitting that you're wrong. And I think if you ask anybody, I mean, this kind of gets down to the insanity of the point I'm trying to make. Like if you ask anybody, if you're like, hey, do you think that you're perfect? Everyone would be like, no, of course I'm not perfect. Well, then if you're mm -hmm. not perfect, then you're making mistakes from time to time. And to act in the moment that, you know, you're perfect is kind of nuts, right? And I think it feeds into this other piece, which, you know, is kind of the other side of the coin to your point where you said, you know, I'll just never forgive this person. And there needs to be some kind of a paradigm shift, I think, at the individual level and then largely at the corporate level or in the minds of leaders where, um, you know, owning that impact, saying I'm sorry, those are fine uh, and those are needed, but also recognizing that when you're forgiving somebody, you're not doing it for them per se you're also doing it for yourself. 
And if you're holding on to that, um, you end up kind of getting in your own way, I think. I mean, what do you think about that? Right. So I agree. It's like, if we can get to the root, what's causing the resistance on the forgiveness and like the apology, we can really dig deeper and it's almost changing our mindset and then teaching our children to change their mindset because it's so, an apology is so powerful when it's rooted from a place of like honesty, integrity, right? And a place of change. But we don't see that anymore because we're like, well, they don't really mean it or they're going to do it again. So like that resentment creeps back in or, um, you know, if I say I'm sorry, I'm looking like I'm the one that like almost lost the battle because it's like we're growing into a culture and I hope we can break it of hash, like almost hashtag winning. Like I win it like I, you know, and it's an individualistic approach. Sometimes it's really harmful. Yeah, it turns us all into islands and it turns us, I mean, when you're drawing these lines in the sand, you're really drawing battle lines and these right. lines can turn into moats and these moats can end up isolating you from other people, right? So um, right. it's like a dangerous spot to be in. Yeah, so I love what you said, like the isolation component. It's we try so hard to protect ourselves that we end up isolating ourselves more than anything and we, mm -hmm. we find ourselves so lonely and afraid. Yeah, and then it... Um, it kind of starts to calcify and then that can start to become your identity if you don't, if you're not careful, right? Like, right. like you said, there's these bullies who grow into sort of corporate bullies, you see uh, a lead of judgmental um, energy and you see, you know, a, um, a lead of, I'm going to hurt you before, like, you're not going to hurt <laughs> me. I'm going to hurt you before you hurt me. Those are all sort of self-reinforcing things for this, you know, what I call this carapace that people sort of grow and carry with them mm -hmm. or the armor that they grow and carry with them for their whole lives. And I mean, they're not doing themselves any favors, which is the crazy part. Um, they think that they're protecting themselves, but I think to your point, we end up just isolating ourselves from like authentic, true human connection with other folks. And that's what we're kind of designed to be. We're not supposed to be these, um, you know, we're not supposed to be living by ourselves in the woods, right? Like we're supposed to be around <laughs> other people to learn and serve each other and help each other and um, sharpen each other and all those things take both like the humility of being able to take input, the, the humility of being able to say, I'm sorry, but also the openness to kind of get new perspectives and kind of change your perspective. Right. So that you can grow, right? So that you yeah. have the ability to like take, take each discussion and each interaction as a, a learning opportunity to grow and better yourself and feel more connected and almost like create together something amazing. That's what we we strive to be, but the reality is we put up these walls and we're like, you know, I'll make sure that you don't get to my stuff and I won't help you because, you know, you're only going to like put me down or tear me apart um, because we're holding on to something from the past. Right. right? Yeah. Um, it's inevitably rooted in the past. Some past hurt to your point um, that nobody wants to feel again. So, you know, I'm going to make sure I don't feel that again. Right. And like, so it comes back to trust. So like, and when we talk about forgiveness, like, I love what you said, like, you know, it really starts to change when it's about, it's not about them. It's about you like going through that process to strengthen, but also forgiving yourself being like, you know, in every interaction, when there's a mistake, there's always an opportunity for us to look back and be like, Hey, so what was my part in that? And how can I be different or do things differently next time? Um, and then forgive yourself to be like, you know what? I wasn't paying attention or yeah, you know, I did do that. And I own that not taking full responsibility, but at least looking about how you had an impact because that's your power and being like, yeah, I did that. Let's change. That is so different than that's all on you. And you did this to me. And well, you yeah, I only did that because you did this right. and this, and, and when you look at it that way, you can see that my response was totally justified. I mean, that's how that cycle kind of perpetuates and that's how like we, we don't break it. Right. So let me, let's, let's double click on that a little bit. Um, I want to talk about it from the perspective of, well, I guess a, a couple of ways, like what, I'm going to sidebar this for a second. What role does like, you know, agreeableness play in your experience in this whole game, right? That's one of the main five sort of personality mm -hmm or personality aspects or something. Um, how do you find agreeableness to correlate, not, not necessarily with bullying, like let's kind of move beyond that because bullying mm -hmm. is of a, of a problem of 
uh, you know, armor wearing or whatever. Do you see right. any correlation there or do you feel like it's just kind of all over the map? So I think that like, you know, okay, so let's, if we take a, agreeableness, um, like in itself, and we decide to kind of explore that as a component, then we can look at like, with when you're like being agreeable, compromising, that can be powerful if you have expectations and boundaries, right? So that um, everyone knows what you expect of them and what they expect of you, but also like you you have the ability to say no when things don't feel right. So you don't feel that you're being used, taken advantage of, because that's when like the resentment starts. And that's when like, you know, so that's really important to address because I feel like, you know, especially in the past few years, we've been pushing this idea of like, you need to set strong boundaries. And sometimes in my training, they're like, what is a boundary? And it's right. like, we need to explore what is it and how do we set them for ourselves so that we don't get us in a cycle of just saying yes to things that doesn't serve us. That's a great point. So I guess to kind of carry that forward a little bit, somebody with high agreeableness can end up with that same carapace around them and it's going to come in a diff, you know, they're going to kind of take a different route there and it's probably going to be a root rooted in some resentfulness or some resentment, whatever the word is, um, that's going to come from a lack of, of boundaries. And why do you think those, those high agreeable people have such a trouble, such trouble with boundaries? So I think that, oh, so some people do and some don't. So I like, you know, I hate like putting everyone in one category, but I would say like people that have like high levels of agree, of agree, agreeability, let's say yeah, that. Yeah, that's the word. <laughs> and, and then, and then they, they want to just, so like a disease to please, like, I just want to make my boss happy. I just want to make my spouse happy, my friends happy. I want to be the best parent, the best coworker, the best friend, like, and it's almost going almost into perfectionism versus like the ability to compromise, if that yep. makes sense. Yep. Um, so when we do that, when we agree just to please everyone else and to look like we're perfect, it comes back like full circle to your point of the idea of perfectionism is, is playing a huge role in like what's driving decisions and putting those shields up. Right. So let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Somebody with low, low agreeability, they seem to have less of a problem establishing those boundaries, but how do you see the carapace or whatever you want to call it sort of developing on, on that side? So I think with low, low ability to like, agreeableness, I think that then the challenge is, um, it's almost like an ego, the ego comes into play. Like, um, and so I'll define ego as your ability to um, really have a, a strong level of pride and self-protection, right? So I don't wanna agree with you because I am 100% sure I'm right. And I want to make sure I'm right. And I also don't want to open my mind to different perceptions because they don't, they're, they're not going to help me at this point because I'm right. Like that's like the, the other level of like, if you look at the spectrum. Um, so I would say that with those people, they have really maybe two set boundaries that they're not willing to kind of um, leverage new ideas or new people into their lives that could add value because they're stuck in their ways. I would say the best way to explain that. That's a, that's a good framework. So let's talk about kind of like, let's bring this into the real world. What sort of tips would you give someone who is trying to kind of break this cycle, right? It's going to take, it always takes someone to start building that bridge across the chasm first. It takes someone to take those first steps. What, what kind of tips do you have or what kind of insights do you have for somebody who's trying to break that cycle maybe in their work? Cause they want to start trying to kind of changing the, the vibe of their culture on their team. Um, what does that take to do and what sort of pitfalls do they have uh, or are they likely to run into? And maybe you can kind of slate it on sort of different points on this uh, agreeability spectrum. Okay. So if we were to take that, so, you know, there's like a gazillion thoughts running through my head. So let's try to, like do it in different segments. Okay. So if, so say you have low agree agreeability and you're really resistant to change. And um, you also, I'm just saying generally, tend to not be fully accountable for your actions. 
because if you're assuming you're constantly right, so I'm looking at like the darker side of that. Yeah. Um, it's really important to address those situations. And like what we talked about before, like what was your role? So like when it comes to things to think about, I would sit down with your team and be like, okay, so here's the project. Here's what went wrong. Here's what went right. Here's what I'm responsible for. And here's how I want things to do to look differently. So as a leader or as a, like a team lead, when you do that, you're bringing it full circle of like, it's almost like doing a SWAT on your final project, but really focusing on, Hey, what are opportunities ahead of us and what do we want to change? And versus what you did wrong is what we could have done better. Um, I think the best way to address like the, like the cycle of blame would be to open up the idea that we are all responsible for our own actions, emotions, and thoughts. And no one has that control over us. You can't make me feel mad because you don't have that power. I'm angry because of what you said, because it triggered something in me, right. but no one, no one has the, the power to make you feel a certain way. It's you, you're owning it. Right. So that ownership is super important when it comes to any degree on that spectrum of uh, agreeableness. Do you think, and uh, then, let me pause you there. Do you think people don't believe that? What, what you just said that uh, yeah. you can't make me feel this way. Do you know what I'm saying? Cause like when oh most God. people yeah. talk about it, I mean, I'm guilty of this myself. Like, um, Oh, this pissed me off. Like, well, no, I allowed myself to get upset by this thing. That's actually a more accurate way to say it. But t I mean, t talk about that a little bit. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so like, that's in like, this is like, we're going a little deep on psychology, but I, I love it. So the idea is once you can identify the emotion, you're feeling anger, sadness, um, resentment, any of those negative emotions, right? You really have to think about like, well, no one can, can make me feel that way because then you're saying you have power over me, right? Right. So, and take ownership, be like, no, that made me angry because, you know, I felt, I felt that I was being targeted. I felt that like, you know, I was being attacked because I wasn't prepared, Right. Right. So that's a kind of a way to like, so the idea is to reframe it. So it's an easy model you can do. So every time you feel an emotion and you're thinking like, you know what, like they made me so angry, stop, be like, okay, I am angry. Now, why do I feel that anger? Well, because they said they were going to turn in this deliverable, this project, or they're going to do something and they didn't. Well, that's because the expectations weren't clear and no one was held accountable. Right. So by walking through that process, you're letting go of that, that blame of you have control over my emotions. Yeah, that's a super powerful thing. And I think, you know, maybe that's, that's the way to frame it for folks to sell them on it. Like if, if you're getting upset by other things, you're letting all these things have power over you, which is crazy, right? Because then you're just a blade of grass in the wind. Anytime the wind changes, anytime somebody cuts you off, you're flying off the handle. And to your right. point, you're really always rooted in something. Um, the anger is just a symptom of, of the real thing, right? You're angry because you're scared or you're angry because mm -hmm. you feel let down or something. Like it's never, the anger is just kind of the surface level of this other root or something. Right. So, you know, we do some, some, of, this, some of this work we do it in schools and then in corporate too. But if you can identify what are your beliefs, your values, and what are your like value statements, it really helps to understand what serves you and what doesn't. Because then you'll, you'll be able to be like, oh, well, when this happened, it goes against my values and it triggers me. So it can create anger, rage, frustration, like, you know, there's a whole spectrum of emotions, negative. Right. And then you're better prepared to not get triggered at like someone cut you off in traffic because you know that rude behaviors go against your values. So that frustrates you. Right. But, and I think also in going through that exercise, it ostensibly helps draw a better perimeter around what you can actually control and what you can't. Right. And it helps you identify your boundaries. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Look at that. You brought it right back home, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. Um, all right. So let's get back into, um, you know, this framework, right, of how to kind of break that cycle. We kind of went off on a little bit of a, of a fun rabbit trail there. Um, <laughs> let's get back to kind of how can we break these cycles in our workplaces and what can we do with folks who are on our team who 
you know, maybe pay lip service to the mission, but on a day-to-day basis, they don't make people feel good or they make people feel like they're being bullied or whatever. How do, how do we as leaders sort of deal with that in the corporate setting um, in a constructive way to kind of, you know, on one hand, meet people where they're at, but then on the other hand, like draw some kind of a line because some behavior is just not going to be tolerated, you know, like where is that line and how do we sort of, you know, maybe attacks the wrong word, but let's just use, use that word. How do we attack that situation to, to help improve it? So I think it's coming back in like, when, especially when we talk about corporate culture, you, it's not just like, you know, repeating the mission, vision, and values, but it's identifying how each individual contributes to that team, that culture, that organization, and understanding, I'm really all about like, um, strength-based training. So an idea that I, I think is really important is once you can identify what people are really good at, like where their target zone is, and find how that aligns with your organization, with your group, with your team, or even your classroom, right? And you leverage their strengths, you can really find an increase of like trust communication because people feel good because they know what they're good at and they're knowing the impact that they're delivering to their team. And with that said, so when you do that, it's really important to then also be aware of what holds someone back. So what is a weakness or something that keeps people stuck? Mm -hmm. So like then through that, if you're to explore like what threatens people in the team, right? So maybe people are threatened by job insecurity, by change, right? So having those open and honest conversations are super important so that you're aware of like the, like the pulse of, of, of your team. And then finally, we all need hope, right? So that's like helplessness is driven by a lack of, of hope. And if we can have hope in an organization, right? Say you have a tight year, right? Or you had to lay off people. The idea is find opportunities that excite people even if they're small and you leverage those to be like, you know what? I'm really excited about today, right? Because today we have X, Y, Z happening and it's because of you and it's because we are to get together, right? right? You don't have to be a motivational speaker, but you have to put in front of the people that you value and care about what they have to look forward to versus focusing on all the bad that's happening and all the things that's going wrong because that does not motivate people to work. That does not motivate classrooms. If I know what I'm bad at and all the things that are going wrong, I'm working based out of fear. But if I know that I am strong, that um, I bring value to the team and I'm looking forward to what's coming towards me, I'm going to work a lot harder because I'm excited. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, You know, Part of it's kind of meeting people where we're at, just to kind of boil, boil down what you said, and please correct me if you think I missed anything, but kind of meeting people where they're at, making them feel safe enough to dive into you know, what's working and what's not, what's driving them, what they're scared of, figuring out where that right seat is for somebody, because many times it's somebody in the wrong seat, um, mm-hmm. and then also being able to incorporate something that's gonna provide some kind of a hope, uh, some kind of a light at the end of the tunnel, some kind of a purpose to that aligns with or resonates with their internal purpose or their, or their inner why, um, when some of those right. things are, are in place, it, I think it probably frees some people up to put those God-given gifts to work in a more positive way versus kind of holding them in or hoarding them out of fear, to your point, or using that kind of fear fuel to motivate them. Right. And, um, and like how we can, so how we can leverage this for anyone listening to is it's a, it's, we just did a SWAT. So we just... Yeah. We did. And, and so it's doing a SWOT on your people. And then I have a tool that I designed. It's a SWOT 2.0 that I use in schools and corporate. So for every weakness that you find, like, and I'm not saying list them all, list one or two, like that keeps you stuck. Find a resource, right? Find something. We have unlimited resources and technology. There's ways to figure out what's to get unstuck. And then secondly, for the threats, Find a strategy. You can't stop everything that might be coming towards you, but you can plan for it so that when it hits you, you know, it bounces back, right? Like, oh, this, like, you know, we're going to lose a client. This is going to hurt. But you know what? We can bounce back because we have all these other opportunities. Incorporate that hope in the mix. 
Yeah. Right. So, and it's like, because we have this, still this kind of, there's like this movement, right. About positive affirmations, positive thinking, positive psychology. And there's still a little resistance of like, Oh yeah, yeah. That's fun when I have time, but we're not taking the time to do it. And we're creating more fear than hope. Yeah. I mean, imagine if people took that same approach to showering. Well, if I have time, I'm going to shower. Like we don't think about that. You know, we, put, we, we don't put showering in that, in that category of, you know, kind of nice to have. But I think if, if, if we move these, moved what you're talking about into that sort of showering category, people would really start to see um, the impact that it has. And frankly, it would probably help people kind of tune into the level of negative self-talk that we are all subjecting ourselves to. I mean, it's very high. Oh, it's so high. It's so high. I mean, and I work in a field where emotions is and exploring emotions and behaviors is my day to day thing. Yeah. And I still have to work on my negative self talk, right? And totally. when I do, it's really difficult because I'm like, well, I'm teaching this. So what is driving that behavior? So you go back to the model we talked about before. But I love the visualization of the shower because it's like it takes five minutes to really do some positive, like we cause it positive like ramping like yeah. where you really talk positive about yourself and then it takes less time to do that than to take a shower so why aren't we doing it and it really changes the game i mean i think some people maybe think it's corny or they think it's stupid or something but it's like try it for a month and tell me if you don't feel right. like a really new person I'm not even right. but, yeah. but like can you imagine like you're like oh this is, doesn't work it's so corny but you're spending all this time like telling yourself that you're a loser, you're a failure, right. never gonna <laughs> you're doing the other thing. Right. All day. Right. right. All day. But you don't have time to say that, like, you know, you're successful, that you're, you're making a difference. Right. It's, it's, it's really a powerful thing. And there's something about your own voice. <laughs> um, it has a bigger impact on yourself. It's like you trust your own voice or something, you know? Right. And, it, and if we can, so I've seen too, there's like an increase of low self-esteem in uh, middle school and high school and an increase in anxiety. And I think it's the culture is shifting, but it's a, let's do this. Like productivity is at an all time high, mm -hmm. but we're just doing things to get them done to like get them off our list. And we're not realizing that if there's no intention behind what we're doing, then the impact is low and there's less self-fulfillment. Yeah, so you're getting a bunch of stuff done, but they're all just kind of halfway getting done or like they're not, it's not having the full dimensionality that, that it could have. Right. Or it, it looks good. Like the other thing, like it looks good on a resume or it looks good to your boss or it looks good as like, you know, especially if you're a parent and you have your kid in a gazillion activities and you're just running into activity, 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 but they don't have downtime. They don't have a chance to get bored. Their imagination is being squashed yeah yeah that's a great point it's like and, that imagination is yeah. getting atrophied or something right and imagination is innovation and creativity so if we're starting to squish that at a very young age then it's really closing doors for us to create new technology new ideas new perceptions because everyone is just too busy so i think that's a great point and i'd love to kind of pivot into this question around social and um, like even reality TV <laughs> and what role that plays in sort of, I mean, you probably see it earlier, right? Um, Cause you're, you're working in schools with kids, but I think it's probably happening in, to adults in the workplace as well. What role does all that judgmentalism, which is really the foundation of all that stuff, play into people's psyches, into their, you know, um, self-consciousness, their, uh, confidence, you know, all these kind of things we're talking about. Is there a relation or not? So I think there's, yeah, I think there's a strong one, especially with like, you know, YouTube, which I love, right? Like mm -hmm. with the, all the YouTube stars, the social influencers, all these people, even though it's a reality show, they're only showing certain snippets of certain situations, but we think it's their current reality. Good so point. In the last 10 years in my field, especially in schools, I've seen a rise in like gossip, rumors, exclusion, like meanness, yeah. like just petty stuff. And I see it in corporate too, um, because it's really funny. Whatever happens in schools, a few years later, or even like 
a time lapse later, mm -hmm. it happens in corporate. Like it's like schools, because it's so raw and so real and so new, almost schools experience it first. And then I right. see it in corporate. So workplace drama, right? Um, you know, all these things are happening and then you watch TV and you're like, well, it kind of makes sense. Like that's what we're being fed, right? Yeah, like if you look at the, you know, I think like the Real Housewives is probably a good example, <laughs> right? Because you see these lives and it's like, oh my gosh, look at those purses and wow, they have this great life. But also sort of foundationally, anybody watching that is just watching it from a total judgmental frame. So then I think <laughs> translating into a fear of being judged all the time and then you end up living in the heads of these people around you and it just kind of creates this really weird cycle where people end up kind of leading to your point to kind of, a really inauthentic place that's, you know, breeds drama. It breeds like lack of connectedness. It breeds these things that are really um, subversive because they're kind of underneath the surface. Right. Because you're, I love what you said. You're living in other people's heads. So you're thinking that they're thinking this of you, right? right. And, and I always tell, I love saying this to my, my students. <laughs> And then because it applies to adults too, it's like people don't have that much time. Like you're really nobody like, cares. nobody cares. <laughs> nobody like, cares about you. Okay. <laughs> right. Good. So, it, it, and, we, and, and we laugh because you realize like, wow, like, right. So I just made up this whole story that's been consuming my energy and time. And they didn't even know that they got me upset. Right. It's but a really thing purpose. though to know what you just said and really digest that and believe it. Right that oftentimes we are so self-involved and that's why when we talked about the ego, right? Self-perception and self-preservation is very important for us. And, you know, the more we can connect to others, the more we can connect to ourselves, we can let go of that and be really our authentic or like, you know, real selves where we're not afraid of judgment and being like, you know, targeted or, or where that ego plays a big part. And the idea is that, is that when we can get to that place of, less fear of being judged, we really can make some strong connections and being like, wow, like you have a great idea. And I love how you did that versus like, that's not going to work. And that sounds stupid. Um, yeah. Which is again, leading with that defensiveness, um, leading with that sort of self-preservation because you feel like you're getting attacked when, you know, again, nobody's even looking at you. No, no, typically they're not. And like, even like with, you know, drama or bullying, someone will be like, well, they keep staring or laughing at me and I'll go over to the group of kids. And you know, more times than not, they're like, no, we were laughing about something else. The same right. thing happens in corporate. Like they're targeting my job or they're trying to get me fired. Sometimes it is true, but most of the times people are busy with their own lives because we're trying to protect ourselves and build our own selves. And we're really self-involved. Yeah, and to your point, it's probably 80-20 if not 90-10. Mm -hmm. maybe even lower, right, of um, people kind of living their own lives and uh, they're not being that, that true basis for this fear. So let's, let's jump to, um, I want to talk a little bit about your book and then I want to talk about a couple of tips as, as we wrap up, a couple of takeaways that somebody can really kind of hit the ground running with today or tomorrow with their team. But before we get to that, um, your book that you just put out is phenomenal. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about it, please. I'd love, uh, I love folks to, to check it out because to your point, there's some really like visceral, powerful stories in there. And those are not, those are, th those, those stories are not relegated to like the feelings at the root of those stories are not, are not re relegated to seventh grade. Oh, no. They're happening all, all over the place or they've happened before and people are still carrying those things with us. So tell us a little bit about the book and kind of what drove you to do it. And I mean, it's, it's really had a tremendous response. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm extremely grateful um, about the book. So the book is a compilation of stories from early elementary up into high school um, of the students we worked with. So what we did is we were able, because we work in school sometimes like for years or months at a time, to collect letters from the victim and the bully. So some of the stories are Dear Bully, Dear Victim, and they write back and forth um, about their experience, not their writing to the person, but about their experience. So it's really just reflecting on their own actions and feelings. Right. But when you match them up, 
the story becomes so powerful because you can see both sides and we forget to look at other people's experiences or we just label like, well, they're the bully. They're just a mean person. She's judgmental. He's, he's aggressive, but we forget to see that sometimes these behaviors are rooted because of our own experiences. So mm. the power is the back and forth. Like it, it brings you, it brings you to tears. It can really evoke some strong emotion. And then for the ones that we weren't able to match because some of them we reply to. So as we call ourselves the bully teachers, so we replied to because it was either too deep or we're like, hey, we need to step in because sometimes as adults, we need to step in and we right. need to share um, the difference between right and wrong and really be that, that advocate for the child. So that's the compilation of stories. The cool part about the book is on top of that, for each story entry, we created a section called Stop and Think. And we bring up strategies and tools and ideas for parents, educators to understand like, hey, what do you do when this happens? In the process of writing the book, we realized, and I love what you said is, it's just more than kids because a lot of adults have read stories and been like, oh, like that's happened to me in the right. workplace. Or, you know, this, this toxic relationship, toxic friendships. We all have them, right? Um, it's just so, it's, it's, it's really eye-opening because it's so real and you can relate to the stories because that's how we really connect to each other is through storytelling and sharing. Um, that's the power. It's every time I read it in one of, when we do, um, when we have a book signing or when we go and we speak, uh, when we read a story, like we always have people in the crowd get extremely emotional or like vulnerable. And they're like, I've been there or that's me or that's my kid. Wow. So it's like, it's mind blowing. It's like, that's what excites me is like, we're, we're able to connect through the power of storytelling. Yeah. It's a really, uh, I feel like it should be like required reading for anybody who's in, I mean, really kind of anybody who uh, deals with other people, whether it's in the school system or whether you're just a leader in, in an organization, because there's so much that you can pull from it. And to your point, everyone's felt it from one side or another. And right. it's not like, Hey, I graduated. So all these feelings are gone. There's so many unprocessed emotions that people carry around with them that are, to your point from before, like rooted in the behaviors that they're exhibiting in the work in the workplace. They're often and usually, you know, they're usually negative and they're usually, you know, kind of contrary to the, you know, the idealized, you know, work culture of inclusivity and, you know, safety and uh, so forth that I think everybody in their heart is kind of driving toward if they don't get too jaded, you know. Right. And like, I love what you said too, because the more negative emotions that we hold on to over a period of time, like we're, we're, we're so far away from love and connection. Yeah. So by breaking them down, you know, because even though like we talked about in the beginning about how love is kind of like, Oh, like love has no place in a workplace. Love doesn't have place. Like, and we push it away, but love is joy. Like if you're, when you're in love with your work, when you're in love with someone, you're in love with your team, it's pure joy, it's bliss. And that's what we want to get to. So we need to let go of all this crap that we're holding on to. Well, it's just, it's, it's a, such a bizarre thing to say, you know, I mean, love is like the language of humans. And it's just su such a bizarre thing to say, well, that had, just has no place in the workplace. Well, it's like, if you have real connections with people, if you have true friendships or you, to your point, love your work, those are all you know, why, why should you have to leave that at the door? It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. And I think it becomes like the point of understanding that when we love, we're being vulnerable and we're letting ourselves open up to others. And that's the fear because I might be right. judged, criticized. So I won't talk about it, but love is love. You can love a puppy. You can love a friend. You can love work. You can love your spouse. You can love your children. It's, it's all the same. It's still love. So we need right. to start talking more about it and being less uncomfortable with it. So maybe that's the tip, unless you have another one. I mean, that's a great tip for folks to kind of lead with that vulnerability as a leader, um, to bring some of that, that love into the workplace and just see what it does. See, see if it doesn't start, start to melt some of those, those, uh, those exteriors that people have sort of accumulated. What else would you add to our listeners right now? So if we're going to, I love if we run with that tip of love, it's finding how you love. So figure out the, 
the best ways that you can show love to your team, to your, to your, to your staff, to the vendors. It's like, do you love through showing gratitude? Do you love through showing like, like appreciation? Do you love through like sharing resources? Like that's love, right? Like, yeah. Hey, read this great book. I, you, last week you talked about something and I thought of you, I, I got it for you. That has a huge impact and that's love. What a great tip. You know, you just fleshed that out some more and um, it just gives people some freedom to actually bring their whole selves to work. And I think, look, we all need, you know, I think in our hearts, we all want to leave the world a better place. We want to make a difference in the lives that we're touching. I just think so, so many times we get um, just jaded from, you know, getting just battered through life and, you know, you know, maybe it's losing that hopelessness, but if we're ever going to change it, it's going to take us as as individuals taking those first steps forward and showing the people around us as leaders that hey it's safe and hey you can you can be yourself and hey being vulnerable is not really a weakness it's actually a strength and um i don't know it feels like you know you said it earlier that we're kind of entering this new age or something and i just it feels that way it feels mm-hmm. like people are kind of ready for these kinds of conversations whereas probably 20 years ago you know well 20 years ago there weren't podcasts but you know, 20 years, ago, <laughs> 20 years ago, you know, a lot of this would seem kind of, uh, I just don't think it would like land with the type of traction that, that these kinds of conversations seem to be getting now. And it's kind of encouraging. Right. It is because it'd be considered foofy. Kumbaya. Yeah, um, so, and the thing is now we're realizing that our emotions drive our intelligence. They drive our work. They drive our productivity. So if we can manage our emotion and be more emotionally literate, it can be really powerful to drive people, empower people, and create change. I love that. See, look at that. We're bringing love into the podcast. I love it. <laughs> Where can people find you? How can they? Um, how can they find your book? How can they work with you? How can they uh, pick your brain more? Where Where can people get at you? Oh well, I, thank you. Um, LinkedIn. So I'm really active on LinkedIn um, because I just love reading and sharing articles. So uh, LinkedIn, my name, Courtney Pegram. And then um, I would say I'm on social media as far as Instagram, uh, Courtney Pegram. Everything is just Courtney Pegram, super simple. Okay. Um, but I love to connect. I love to share resources. And if it's okay with you, if you want to share with your audience, I can share some of that, the, the tool, the SWAT that we talked about oh, cool. so that they can apply it. It's like, it's, it's super easy, but sometimes people need like an actual model. Yeah. So when they're in their team through it. So I would love to share that. Um, and um, I'm all about giving resources. So awesome. Yeah. If you send that over, we'll just attach it to like the show notes and make it available for folks. But um, I just appreciate you so much. I've been, it's been great getting to know you. And I just have really enjoyed our time together today. There's some really cool stuff that uh, we ended up getting into. And some really great kind of actionable tips for, um, for our listeners. So um, yeah, just thank you so much for joining us on the ethics experts today. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, my brain's on fire. I'm really excited. Thanks again. (laughs) Thanks, Courtney. Okay, talk to you soon.